background uh, very briefly because I think that's quite important to understand, especially for uh, the outside uh, audience to understand some of the dynamics that I will be explaining later in, in my presentation. And when it comes to development uh, of right-wing extremist scene in Czech Republic and Slovakia, there are three more or less rather distinct uh, phases. First one started right after the end of communism, uh, maybe even a couple of years uh, before that. And it's something that I would call the skinhead period, you know, the typical uh, subculture, music, uh, neo-Nazi outlook and, and um, all these kind of old fashioned elements that were very characteristic for that period. Then uh, more or less around 2005 or six, uh, new um, ideas, new ways of organizing uh, these movements uh, came into the region, uh, mostly from Germany. I, mean, I would elaborate on that um, a bit later. Uh, leaderless resistance as a principle, autonomous nationalists, uh, which essentially ruled the scene for, for a couple of years. And then, and we are now coming uh, uh, to the current days, uh, as of 2013, 2014, there was a major transformation, I would say. Uh, uh, one part of the milieu uh, went into politics and some of them more suc successfully than the others, while the, the paramilitary elements, which were largely dormant in the previous periods or that were not that uh, uh, not that visible, uh, started to grow in importance and uh, in, in visibility as well. So I divided the international connections into three, um, three different streams or elements. First one is ideological and political connections. Second, personal and organizational. And the third one is the element of paramilitary uh, and the Russian link or the Russian connection, which is quite peculiar, especially when it uh, comes to the, the recent uh, developments in Czech Republic. I will touch upon briefly uh, as, as well. So essentially, uh, historically, uh, looking into developments and, and trends within this, uh, this milieu in the two countries, what I often observed was a kind of a, a transfer of know-how, so to say, from, from Germany as kind of the originator to Czech Republic and then to Slovakia. Uh, Czech Republic and Slovakia, obviously, uh, due to the 70 years of a common state and uh, many, many links, personal links, cultural links, language proximity, still act as a very uh, uh, relevant and very important uh, duo of countries and the transfer of uh, principles, organizational principles or, or concepts happens usually in this, in this direction. And that was definitely the case with autonomous nationalists and some other uh, more, recent, uh, more recent formats. An interesting case is uh, the um, identity movement or generation identity, which uh, originated in, in France, if I'm not mistaken, and then uh, through Germany, again, and Czech Republic uh, entered also Slovakia, but uh, currently is more in a dormant phase and is not as, as visible and as it was. Um, another important element I want to highlight here was the impact of Pegida and uh, the, the, the whole issue of, uh, of Islamophobia and the focus on, on Islam as the main kind of enemy for the right-wing extremist scene in this, in this region, which was not that uh, prominent previously, but uh, since 2015, the migration crisis, uh, the, the, the Islam and the alleged um, you know, grow, or growth of, of uh, um, impact of, of Islam in Europe uh, has become one of the major, major points, uh, rally points for, for right-wing extremist groups in both countries. And this is just one particular example of, uh, of the, um, the links and the connections. Uh, this young gentleman here is actually a member of Slovak parliament. Uh, his name is Milan Mazurek and he is a convicted uh, felon. Uh, he was convicted to 5,000 euros fine for his racist, open racist remarks. And yet he was re-elected uh, recently in 2020 back into Slovak parliament and is actually one of the kind of, I would say, leading figures, leading figures of Slovak far-right scene. 
and he is a frequent uh, visitor at Polish Independence March. Uh, he speaks even Polish language, and uh, he is kind of the, the new face of the of the right wing extremism in this in this region. This is just again an illustration of of how the the generation identity identity movement uh, was kind of translated and uh, and um, adopted uh, in this particular case in Czech Republic. But as I say, uh, as far as I know, the, the the impact of this of this movement is is currently rather um, let's say muted and not not so um, prominent as it was. Then the second uh, level of of coordination and cooperation is personal and organizational one and uh, the, the extremist scene in these two countries has obviously mm, uh, very significant outreach to neighboring countries but also uh, beyond uh, important elements are highlighted here in poland it's uh, right-wing extremist hooligan subculture and then particular events uh, whether um, you know, organized uh, um, at the anniversary of Polish independence, the March of Patriots, or some other smaller events. Uh, but Poland, as, as uh, also Kacper highlighted in his presentation, is seen by many from this region as kind of a role model, as a place where you can be free from the liberal yoke uh, that, that, you know, is present in, in Czech Republic and Slovakia. Italy, uh, historically, uh, also in the first uh, two periods that I uh, outlined in the presentation, uh, was very important uh, because of the music connection. And I know that CEP, in your report, you also covered extensively the, the importance of music as, a, as, as an element, both from financial and, and network building uh, um, angle. Uh, and then obviously Germany, you know, aside from uh, from serving as kind of a source for ideas, uh, organizational uh, structures, also is very important uh, as a meeting place. Uh, there were mutual, uh, let's say, visits both from the region to Germany and from Germany to both countries uh, where speakers from NPD, AFD and some other organizations participated. Uh, to basically support uh, uh, their their um, partners from from the region, Hungary is kind of a peculiar case because historically, uh, especially when it comes to Slovak-Hungarian relations, uh, the the chauvinism and strong nationalism basically prevented any closer cooperation. But there are and there were occasions when uh, when extremists uh, from both countries. Uh, Czech Republic and Slovakia visit Hungary and one particular date is Day of Honor, uh, which again has become a very important uh, marching point uh, and meeting point for uh, extremists from all over the, the region. Uh, and now we come to uh, the element that, that was highlighted also in Kacper's presentation, and that is the importance of training and paramilitary activities for the extremists. And I want to highlight at the very beginning that, well, we could not really uh, put um, the, the equation mark between paramilitaries and extremists. There are a number of groups that are not uh, extremists and uh, people join all kinds of paramilitary activities for different reasons. However, uh, the, other, uh, the other principle applies. Most extremists, for some reason, are gun lovers and they just like to hang around uh, different uh, military-related uh, activities, whether it's uh, shooting ranges, survival camps, uh, online prep communities. Wherever you look, you would find people who are members, active members of uh, various extremist groups. So while, as I said, not all paramilitaries are extremists, you, it's very likely that you would find most of uh, extremist activists involved in one or other type of uh, paramilitary or military uh, related activities. And important element that is present, obviously, uh, in both countries, in Slovakia and Czech Republic, uh, and I would just uh, subscribe to, to Kacper's uh, uh, points that the commercial, the commercial element. Um, there is a booming, uh, booming uh, um, scene for commercial services, uh, all kinds of uh, tactical trainings that are basically provided to any 
uh, interested parties without um, basically no questions asked, no um, no major uh, barriers or or you know uh, any checks, uh, security checks being placed. Yet when it comes to perhaps people on on international watch list, that's a different story. But for like rank and file extremists from other countries, uh, it is uh, it is rather easy to either just cross the border from Germany to Czech Republic. And there were several cases, I will illustrate some of those, of known German extremists coming over to Czech Republic to train, but also uh, to Slovakia, which is kind of more, uh, let's say, hidden or off the radar uh, on, these, um, on, on, on these activities. And last but not least, and I would also highlight this in my presentation, are ideologically motivated paramilitaries not necessarily motivated by, by uh, right-wing political uh, convictions, but uh, anti-system uh, or in one shape or, or another, basically uh, against the, the current establishment. And uh, they try to create, some of them try to create even their own political projects uh, uh, from, from the, the members of such, such paramilitary groups. So the first kind of case study is, is Czech Republic. And uh, there were several cases when, when German, in particular German extremists were actually apprehended after they participated in, uh, in uh, uh, military training, in shooting uh, ranges uh, in, in Czech Republic. And upon their return, uh, they were, some of them were, were prosecuted. Um, if I'm not mistaken, those cases are still ongoing. But it just highlighted kind of the well-known situation where it is much easier, much cheaper, and, and much more affordable uh, for, for either German or other Western European um, extremists just to come over to this part of Europe and to acquire uh, military training to, to uh, access shooting ranges without much questions being, being asked. And, uh, Perhaps a couple of words uh, regarding the, the, the recent uh, case that rocked the international landscape and how it connects uh, to both countries. Uh, you might ask yourself, why is it uh, so that, that you know, uh, Czech Republic has become a target of, of uh, GRU, uh, GRU unit specialists who blew up uh, a, a munition uh, depot in, uh, in, in Moravia? And the, the answer is rather simple, and that answer is that uh, both Czech Republic and Slovakia serve and historically have been serving as a source of uh, ammunition and weapons from the communist leftover stockpiles uh, for foreign markets. And, uh, you know, there were cases when, uh, when you know, these weaponry ended either in, um, in Ukraine or in Syria or in other conflicts around the world. And apparently these two gentlemen who are also known from the Salisbury attack uh, traveled to Czech Republic. They, uh, they arranged their meeting uh, at the arms depot. Uh, and uh, well, in the same time period when they were supposed to come to this arms depot, uh, the explosion happened, which basically destroyed the whole, uh, the whole building and the whole, whole um, area. Uh, so I just want to highlight that, well, Slovakia and Czech Republic still have a significant uh, stockpiles of ammunition and, and, and arms that uh, are kind of a magnet for, for um, weapons uh, smugglers or we weapon uh, traffickers. And then, uh, you know, it also happens that, that uh, foreign services such as the GRU become, become interested. And now, is there a link between, you know, homegrown paramilitary groups, right-wing extremists, and Russian actors. Well, there are kind of very conducive conditions uh, to have uh, such connections, but uh, I wouldn't say that, that it's also well connected. But again, just to give you a bit of a background, public attitudes both in Czech Republic and Slovakia are largely sympathetic to Russia. Whether that will change after this recent case, that's an open question. There are uh, several known cases of Czechs and Slovak volunteers traveling to Donbas. Uh, because of these largely pro-Russian attitudes, 
a large majority of, uh, of those volunteers actually fought on the pro-Russian side uh, with the separatists, not on the Ukrainian one. And uh, most far-right political actors uh, are very open in their pro-Russian attitudes. And we have a booming, uh, booming paramilitary uh, scene. And on top of all these, uh, there are mm, you know, very mm, numerous and, and I would say uh, visible um, martial arts schools uh, in particular, the Sistema Martial Arts School that, that, that was and is uh, uh, Russian in origin and that uh, usually is run by Russian instructors. So is there a kind of a link to GRU? Well, I will tell you at the end of my presentation. This is another interesting case study. I want to highlight how this uh, connection and this kind of uh, uh, fluidity between the, the paramilitary and uh, the foreign fighters with potential links to um, extremism works. This young gentleman was one of the founding members of uh, Slovak conscripts. Uh, he was active there until 2014. And then suddenly in 2015, he was uh, identified in a report by uh, Russian TV as one of the commanders of 15th International Brigade in Donetsk People's Republic. And he still remains there. Uh, he became some kind of a star or celebrity in the, in the paramilitary uh, milieu. And uh, he, I believe, even married a, a, a Russian woman and still lives in, in Donetsk. Then we have uh, another interesting case of uh, a leader uh, of uh, Slovak far right, I wouldn't say extremist party, uh, uh, our um, Slovakia People's Party, Mr. Marian Kotleba, who can, uh, when he ran for president, he had uh, such a banner for Slavic unity against war with Russia. And this is just one you know, very visible uh, example of the pro-Russian attitudes of, of, of this uh, far right political party. Uh, sorry. Uh, and then, uh, as I mentioned, we have uh, schools, we have martial arts schools that, that uh, provide uh, training to any interested uh, participants. And this particular is, is rather interesting because it's run by a Slovak uh, a gentleman who boasts about his, uh, his experience and his training with the GRU uh, Spetsnaz unit which is, uh, by the way, prohibited uh, according to Slovak legislation because no Slovak citizen could serve in foreign army. It's, it's a crime, essentially. But he boasts about spending uh, some time with GRU and receiving the Spetsnaz, uh, Spetsnaz training. He even has a, a, a tattoo uh, on, his, on his arm, uh, Spetsnaz. The question is whether you know, it was some kind of an offshoot training or it was kind of the real part of Russian military, but, but still, you know, he, he likes to, to boast about this and to present uh, this Sistema uh, Martial Arts School as, as such. And then there's political messaging. The Slovak conscripts, the paramilitary group that is perhaps the most important, uh, is very open in their, in their views. And this picture was taken very recently when the tensions between Russia and Ukraine are uh, increasing. And they say, we will not raise our weapons against Russia. And you know, this is the most important, the most numerous paramilitary group operating, operating in Slovakia. And its leader, uh, who has clear political ambitions, uh, you know, has repeated very open statements that Russia is not our enemy. Uh, we should not be henchmen to foreign interests. You know, we should aim for neutrality and so on and so forth. And now it becomes really interesting. You know, the same group, the same paramilitary group received uh, a training by Igor Zorin. And if you look up this gentleman, he's an ex uh, Spetsnaz uh, member who is up until this very day providing training to Russian special forces. And several years ago, uh, you know, this is one of the very few public, uh, publicly accessible pictures from that training. Uh, the gentleman on the right hand side is, is called Mr. Doval, who is one of the commanding officers of Slovak conscripts. And uh, the, 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 the guy in the middle uh, with the black shirt is Mr. Zorin. And Mr. Zorin is, is pictured on, you can look him up on YouTube, on, on, on Facebook, on any publicly available social media. And he is titled as uh, Veteran Vajeno Razvietki, the veteran of, of military intelligence. 
and he even posts pictures from the GRU headquarters. So, you know, it's not like someone who just, you know, happens to, to be serving uh, a long time ago in GRU. He still visits GRU. He still boasts about his links to uh, Russian military intelligence. And again, these pictures are relatively recent and he still until this very day provides training to Russian special forces. And yet there is no issue whatsoever to invite him as an instructor to provide training to Slovak paramilitary units. And now I move on to another interesting piece of the puzzle and that is night wolves. Night wolves, I believe are quite well known to most uh, participants of this seminar as a notorious Russian by gang that basically is uh, very well connected to Vladimir Putin, you know, the gentleman in the middle, obviously. Uh, the guy on the left hand side, uh, uh, Alexander Zaldostano, so called surgeon, is uh, kind of very close to Putin. He's pictured uh, repeatedly uh, uh, on this picture, for example, riding alongside Putin, and Nightfalls even received funding. Uh, you can again look it up from open source uh, uh, information how how many thousands of, of, of euros or, or you know, rubles uh, Nightfalls received for their activities directly from the presidential office. And more in, importantly, uh, Nightfalls were involved in fighting in, in, the, um, in Ukraine, in, obviously on the side of Russian separatists. Uh, there are numerous reports. Uh, I would highlight maybe the Canadian uh, military intelligence report that is again publicly available that very well outlines the extent to which uh, night wolves played a very important role, both in Kremlin and in the fighting in, in Donbass. And now they turned into these, you know, uh, uh, very, as, as they call it, nice people uh, that they just want to uh, celebrate the victory over fascism. And they just organize these rides from Moscow to Berlin. This year, actually, it will be the other way around from uh, European countries and uh, the, the end, uh, the finish would be in Moscow. What is interesting and important though is, well, if the only purpose, the sole purpose of these rights is to celebrate victory over fascism and to pay uh, memory, you know, to all the fallen soldiers, why on earth would they bring a, a flag of uh, unrecognized Donetsk People's Republic? Unless there are some other more ulterior motives. And moving on, uh, in 2018, in summer, uh, they, they organized, Nightfalls organized uh, uh, what they call European headquarters. Uh, it is basically a, a compound owned by one Slovak businessman who also happens to, to uh, assemble uh, derelict uh, or, you know, in functional uh, military equipment. Uh, on this particular picture, you could see some, uh, some tanks and... Uh, APCs, I would, I just want to stress that, that these are not like uh, functional vehicles, you know, they are from, uh, they were borrowed from a military museum, but uh, the, the plan was to turn this compound into some kind of a, uh, you know, a theme park or a museum for, for bikers and, uh, and uh, for lovers of, of military. What, what is interesting, though, that, you know, in this very same compound, you know, there are functional APCs uh, that um, are then used by existing uh, paramilitary groups, such as the Slovak conscripts. And this is picture from their own Facebook account, where they've been boasting about having access to such equipment and being able to train, you know, with, uh, with APCs uh, in, this, in this compound. And well, just kind of to highlight uh, how warm their relations are, um, you know, the, the gentleman on the right hand side is the head of so called European headquarters of Nightwolves, and the gentleman on the left hand side is the commander of Slovak conscripts. And whenever the Russian friends come over to visit, uh, you know, these two, these two uh, gentlemen, both uh, the, the head of Slovak branch or European branch, if you wish of Nightwolves and the head of Slovak conscripts are there to meet and greet them. So in conclusion, is there some kind of unholy alliance and or are these, you know, just a, a motley crew of uncoordinated actors? Well, I think it's, it's both. They definitely share some of common goals. They have a kind of a, a, the same enemy being it the EU, NATO or US, uh, but uh, they also have some, some 
differences and there are obviously personal animosities and, and conflicts between the, the different groups. But at times they, could, they can organize themselves uh, for, for public events or uh, they can share, let's say, their training grounds and they can support each other also in the virtual domain. The, the question to what extent this is all organized and coordinated by Russian secret services is, I believe, outside of the scope of today's discussion. But, uh, you know, there are definitely signs that, that it, let me say, they are just uh, have, they have an open door in, in Russian embassies in both countries. And let me, uh, let me stop here.